Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me. May I just actually be really non-governmental organization representative for a minute and ask everybody to stand up. Just stand up, get some more blood in your brains, and I think that'd be quite good after sitting for so long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is a, please do, because then you'll listen to me much better and also listen better to Carl afterwards. Thank you so much. It might be a little bit unusual, but uh, you may even want to turn around and say hello to everybody around you. This is what we do in my meetings. Thank you so much. Now I will start. <laughs> it's, um, it, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for having me. Um, just as a, and thank you for the introduction. I started working on the BB&J treaty way before it became a treaty. Um, I, uh, I started working with this topic in 2003, and it's followed me all through my career. But I wouldn't say I'm an expert, because there's so much to this agreement. You've heard a little bit about it already, and there's so many different parts of this agreement, and so many different details. And I believe also, as Lorenzo was saying this, sorry, Vasco was saying, so much uh, left, actually, to, to be done and to, to be worked on uh, in the years to come. But I will talk to you about uh, environmental impact assessments. But um, just introduce uh, EIA's environmental impact assessments a little bit. There's been so much talk and so much media attention to the BBNJ Treaty when it comes to marine protected areas. That's really been sort of the main focus of us NGOs. It's been the main focus of the media who, who, uh, who pick up on our press releases and our, our briefings. This is really the big thing. But I do believe that the environmental impact assessments is hugely important in order to protect and conserve the marine environment and to ensure the sustainable use of marine resources. Um, also, just want to put a little focus on, uh, on, on the focus of marine resources in the agreement. It's quite interesting because um, the users of the marine environment, and including the high seas, aren't only using marine resources. They're also affecting marine life in very different ways, like, for example, ships. Uh, ships through noise. I saw a huge cruise ship coming in here this morning. The noise from cruise ships uh, in sensitive marine areas in which tourists want to go and look at interesting uh, wildlife is hugely important. But it is, not, um, it, it is not a use of the marine resources. It's a use of the sea. So just put that into to your minds as well. We're talking about the ocean space more broadly as well. And, and uh, I do believe that the treaty covers that, but it's just interesting that the language that was cho chosen uh, is more about the resources than it is about the, the, the marine space. And perhaps that's where that word environment comes in as well. So that's uh, just a little bit of stuff that I hadn't even thought about that I was going to talk to you about. Um, EIAs can be used also for um, capacity building. Uh, so it actually can be used for helping to implement other parts of the treaty. And Carl's going to talk about capacity building, I believe, after myself. Um, uh, and it can help to enhance co cooperation between states and between various actors and stakeholders who are interested in using or preserving the, the marine environment and its resources. Um, and all of this are, of course, really important to fulfill the international commitments that states have made towards each other, including the SDGs that, uh, that Andre talked about in his introductory presentation. Um, during the negotiations, um, so the last few years, um, there has been quite a lot of effort uh, intercessionally and in side events to try to create more understanding about what some of these elements could do. The negotiations are usually carried out by the lawyers, I'm not a lawyer, as you heard, I'm a marine biologist, but a little bit of dabbling in, in the Law of the Sea through uh, Rhodes Academy course many years ago. Um, but also to showcase what kind of frameworks and laws that are out there already today that actually can help implement uh, EIA uh, provisions in the, in the agreement, because we're not starting from scratch. There are EIA uh, legislation, the EIA um, uh, practice across the world. And the EU was very, very active in the negotiations on the EIA chapter for this reason, with lots of experts being involved, which I think was very useful. Uh, I, I'm not sure I will have time, uh, but I do have a, uh, an example also from the IMO on how 
uh, we can use existing uh, measures and practices already in international fora on, uh, to sort of inform and start implementing the IA uh, chapter even before it's actually entered into force, which might take a few years, the whole agreement. Um, in Article 1, and I won't go through all of this, um, the definition of an environmental impact assessment is that it means a process to identify and evaluate potential impacts of an activity uh, to inform decision making on how to manage that activity. Should it be allowed? Should it not be allowed? How should it be allowed to proceed? This is really important. The word process here is really, really key. Um, the parties to UNCLOS, they are already required to ensure that all planned activities um, or proposed maritime activities are subject to an EIA through the UNCLOS duty to protect and preserve the marine environment. Um, so this inclusion of this part four on EIAs in, ABN, in uh, the BBJ agreements is intended then to operationalize this, this general provision and just as with the ABMT uh, chapter, uh, this obligation to carry out the EIAs. Uh, when WWF started working on the agreement and we, we started out proposing that this would be the tool for marine protected areas, and we started looking into the various parts that were being proposed, we, we came to the realization that actually what, what really will make a huge difference is if we can protect migratory species throughout the ranges from, uh, from adverse impacts on them, and that would need a whole ocean approach, and this is where we need environmental impact assessments which is why I'm so pleased to be talking about EIAs here today. So we did quite a lot of work on assessing, mapping out migratory species pathways, what kind of threats they encounter throughout their life, life range, their ranges, their life stories from mating to having babies to feeding uh, and so forth. And they do uh, encounter a lot of different threats or different impacts. And, and this is just a few of them. And so we started talking about the migratory species as being a little bit of a, um, uh, an ambassador uh, for, uh, for, this, uh, for this agreement and why uh, we need a, a whole of ocean approach and why we need to look at larger areas of the ocean and how these are being affected and how activities can be controlled uh, in this area. So, but who is responsible then for an EIA? Um, there was some discussion in the beginning about that a, an EIA should be taken collectively. This is, after all, in the high seas. Um, it's it's a, an area where, where which is everybody's, um, and, and there was ideas about that a collective EIA would also be more resource efficient, but states were adamant that this was going to continue to be a state-led approach. So it's parties uh, that are to ensure that the, the vessels that are carrying out activities in this area um, uh, are being uh, assessed before they are authorized. What's interesting is that uh, it is possible for another party to the, the uh, BBNJ agreement to ask the conference of the parties to provide advice and assistance to a party doing an EIA. Um, and this is, of course, also really important um, if, if there are some, uh, uh, perhaps some um, questioning about the, the, the capability of a party to actually carry out the, the assessment. Um, the problem uh, is that an EIA could be carried out by a state who might not care too much about the marine environment and might carry out a sort of a flag of convenience EIA rather than a proper, proper uh, EIA. And this is why this uh, article here uh, is important to us. Um, the other 
article here that's important um, uh, also is, is how can the agreement provide input and set standards and guidelines because the provisions in the agreement are still not fully developed. Um, we came as far as was possible uh, at the point of conclusion of the agreement. So it's great to see Article 38, um, where the uh, scientific and technical body established under the agreement um, can prepare standards and guidelines for how EIAs shall be conducted specifically. Um, and these will then be adopted by the BBJ COP. And this is also a way of making the treaty more um, future-proof, if you wish. Um, this is an opportunity to continue to build on experience, build on new practices, building on new understanding about what our ocean, how it functions and what our ocean needs in order to be uh, protected into the future with cumulative impacts uh, and climate change coming down uh, the road, or is here already really. What kind of activity should be included in, uh, in an EIA then? Um, so importantly, there's no list in the agreement for, for activities being um, included in the environmental impact assessment process. Instead, which I think is really good, um, is that all activities that are deemed to have more than a minor or transitory effect um, need to be screened by the party that is responsible for this activity. Um, and this is actually the first step in an EIA process. So it means that all activities are actually part of an EIA process, but they may not go through the whole EIA process. Um, because there are two thresholds in the agreement for, connect, for conducting a, an EIA. Um, if only more than minor transfer effects are likely, or if they are uh, unknown or poorly understood, then you do the screening. And if the screening then indicates substantive pollution or significant and harmful changes to the marine environment, then the individual party is obliged to conduct a full EIA consistent with the, the part four. And so this is important uh, as new, we don't, have, we don't have full knowledge of what the ocean can take, and we don't have full knowledge of what all activities on the ocean what impact they have on the ocean. So this is a, this is a really important part um, to be included in the agreement. In Article 31, uh, the process for conducting EIAs um, is set out should the th second threshold be met. So if there is uh, uh, enough, uh, under enough evidence that there will be uh, a significant impact or, or more, more than uh, minor and transitory impact. And then there's a series of steps, uh, steps that are detailed in this article about how this should happen, which I won't go through, but they basically, uh, there are three main areas here. One is to scope the potential impacts. So what are the potential impacts? What kind of impacts are they? And they're not only environmental, they're also economic and social impacts, which is really, really important. Vasco uh, had a, a note on his slide about this one in regards to the ISA. The ISA is not looking at other impacts and environmental impacts in its EIA regime. So this is quite interesting. This is putting more into uh, what needs to be part of the, what could be part of the scope. Uh, so what should be assessed. Um, and then the, you go through the impact assessment and the evaluation. Um, you allow the activity under the, the, the premises that the EIA allows for. Um, and then you have to prevent uh, and mitigate and manage these potential adverse impacts that may still occur. Um, this is the high seas, right? This is big waves, deep waters, um, hard to control vessels. Uh, adverse impacts may happen even though you have put in safeguards. So how do you manage that? And how do you, uh, how do you uh, reduce those impacts? So that's a very, very important part. Um, Another important uh, feature here is that parties may conduct joint EIAs. They may, so it is possible, it's not forbidden, they may. Um, and this is great uh, uh, for many states who do not have uh, the technical know-how themselves, who can then co collaborate with others. Or perhaps this is an area uh, which is adjacent to their EZ. So for example, in the, in the Pacific, um, 
between uh, small island developing states who themselves uh, uniquely, uh, one by one, do not have the capacity, but they are uh, looking at uh, activities close to shore, that might be a good place to collaborate. Um, a roster of experts is to be created as well under the, uh, the uh, STB. Um, and here you can then request advice and assistance if you have capacity constraints. Um, this is also part of the capacity building and transfer of marine technology issue, so we're kind of straddling into other parts of the agreement here. Um, the sharing of this knowledge and this, uh, this insights on how to manage activities and what the activities, the impacts they may have are, or features of a particular ocean region um, is really important as well because that will then inform further activities and may even inform marine protected area establishment. And the clearinghouse mechanism which is to be established under the agreement uh, to manage data coming in and out um, uh, will have a really important role here in receiving uh, reports and other doc documentation for these EIA procedures and making that documentation then available for others. Uh, very important part of, of the agreement as well. So when, um, when an EIA has happened, a, uh, an activity has been allowed to, to go ahead. Um, there are also articles covering monitoring and reviewing and re monitoring and reporting uh, of these activities and, and of the restrictions of these activities. Uh, and this uh, monitoring and reporting needs to, this documentation needs to go back into the clearinghouse mechanism uh, and be examined by the scientific and technical body. Um, and this, should there be any discrepancies, any big red flags here, then um, the, uh, the, uh, there could be a review of this activity uh, or, and of the premises under which this activity has been uh, has been uh, allowed uh, by, uh, by the scientific and technical body uh, thereafter. And, and that's also really, really important. But it, the action uh, of review remains responsibility of the party that, that allowed the activity in the first place. It all comes back to the flag state. Um, as I said, data in the process can be used for other processes, super important. We don't know so much about the ocean, so any data that we can find and share is important in order to make sure that we can apply the ecosystem-based approach, for example, um, and it can be used for, for further EIAs for next time. A similar activity uh, is being proposed. We already have data, so we can start at a different level. It will be less costly really important for states uh, and, and probably also for companies who might be seeing these costs passed on to them. So the more an EIA is being conducted for an area or for an activity, the more we'll know about it, and that's a good thing. Um, as I said, capacity building can also be, be um, uh, enhanced uh, through EIA processes, and in particular if they are collaborative. The last part of the agreement is strategic environmental assessments, and this is really cool. Um, me thinks. Um, it's the last article of, of this part. Um, strategic environmental assessments are a bit peculiar. Um, they aren't looking at a single activity in a single place. Um, they were looking at larger sets of activities, of what's called pro programs and plans, um, and, and so an SEA is a much broader take on, an, uh, on a set of activities in an area and uh, a more collaborative approach of assessing these impacts but also on their impacts upon each other. So it's a little bit of an interesting um, uh, development there because this really can look at the, the cumulative impacts which we now know that oceans are really... Um, suffering from, from the various activities that have been and are managed through sectoral approaches with ISA for seabed mining, RFMOs for fishing, and IMO for shipping. Uh, and here we can look at them more together. Or you can look, for example, at a, um, a shipping route. So instead of you looking at one ship going through one area, you look at a whole route 
thousands of ships every year going through an area and what the impact are of that on the marine environment and what you need to mitigate those impacts. Um, and this particular article is not a compulsory article under the agreement. This is, not, this is, a, this is something that you, you can do, you can consider. You shall consider conducting SEA. So it's, it's weak, but it is a positive thing, we think. Uh, we, as WWF, when we were advocating for SEA to be part of the agreement, we did not want it to be compulsory because that would be too heavy. But to have the option to do that, if states want to come together to conduct SEA for an area, is, a very, is very positive. Um, and this can then improve knowledge and understanding of the resources in the region. So, for example, for fishing, uh, you can enable baseline studies, um, inform baseline studies of, of the natural assets of an area. You capture synergies, looking at you know, one category of users, such as shipping, uh, to the, to the, the ben benefit of all users. Um, uh, and I spoke about shipping lanes, but you could also look at, for example, bottom trawling or longline fishing in an area. So specific fishing gear can also be a, a scope of study for an SEA. Um, and then, as SEA is a big data gathering exercise, you can then use the data there to then support specific EIAs and make the data burden, the data collection burden, much, much lower. So I think that one is sort of the big bang for the buck um, uh, if states do uh, decide to get together uh, and, and study an area uh, for a certain um, uh, program or a group of activities. And it'll be interesting to see where that first exercise will be. I would like it to be in the Indian Ocean, in the north, uh, south of Sri Lanka, with a huge shipping lane that is uh, threatening blue whales in that area. That would be very cool. Do we have time to talk a little bit more about the Polar Code, or should we? I can also just talk to people in the over lunch about if that would be interesting for some. I don't want to take too much of your time. Yeah? Okay. Right. Just going to get my notes because that one is something I know a little bit less about from my heart. Um, yeah. So maybe first to say that um, coming back to the objectives of, the, of part four on EIAs, um, if these articles that I was talking about get implemented, um, Obviously, the objectives of the part will be, uh, will be fulfilled, but um, the implementation of this part can also contribute then to implementing other parts of the BB&J agreement and ultimately lead to better cooperation between countries, between parties, but also between activities as stakeholders to ultimately conserve and better use, sustainably use the resources in the high seas. Um, and also achieve then SDG 14, um, the Kunming Montreal Protocol and other important um, soft agreements that states have, have made to each other. Um, Vasco spoke about the not undermining commitment that states made when the uh, treaty uh, negotiations were being um, were, were were to, well, when one decided that there should be some negotiations to potentially get a treaty, which we got in 2011. Um, this was a really hard fight, which, uh, which I think essentially was between um, distant water fishing nations um, and, uh, and countries that you may say have less skin in the game, who are a little bit more conservation minded, and the EU I think was one of those uh, groups that, uh, together with the Pacific Island developing states, that really, that really uh, 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 made sure that the, um, the focus on, on environmental protections remained strong. But we did end up with um, an interesting, not undermining uh, um, admonition, which, which is clearly uh, set out in the treaty. This treaty shall not undermine other bodies, agreements, and processes. Um, there's an acronym for that, which I've conveniently forgotten, um, but I'm sure Carl knows it. IFBs, yes, which for me is International Fisheries Bodies, which is why I find it so, but it's not, so it's 
international frameworks and bodies, right? Yes, other international frameworks and bodies sh this agreement should not undermine. Uh, and of course, the delivery I is mostly made by states. So delivering upon the agreement, states are delivering upon the agreement. But fishing remains with, our, with RFMOs, shipping regulation remains with, uh, with uh, IMO and seabed mining regulations with the ISA. Um, but so I wanted to, uh, and I think that maybe sometimes um, the negotiations sort of didn't really, um, because everybody has so much to do uh, and, uh, and we have to focus. Um, there was sometimes I think not enough attention put to uh, understanding what is already out there, that we don't have to build everything from scratch by implementing this agreement. So that's why I wanted to talk a little bit about the Polar Code. I'm not a specialist on the Polar Code, but I have colleagues who are. Um, so voyage planning is something that's really started to become very, very important in the shipping world, and particular in sensitive areas such as the poles, where we, you know, you know ice is smelting, new shipping routes are, are uh, coming up. There's still a lot of risks. Voyage planning is mostly about risk. It's not about the environment. It's about risks to ships and risks to staff. Um, and the environment comes last. But uh, in the polar code, also the risks to the environment when it comes to voyage planning um, has become a strong feature. Um, and, so, uh, and also, of course, voyage planning is really good for fuel saving. So you want to take the shortest route you can uh, or go slower so you can save uh, fuel and, and, uh, and have less ca uh, carbon emissions, which is also very, very important. Uh, but you can use this same practice to, to, uh, to, to implement the BB&J provisions, actually, on, on EIAs. Um, in, in the uh, Polar Code, there is something called a significant impact uh, threshold. Um, and if you look at cumulative impacts of minor and transitory effects on the marine environment under the BB&J agreement, you can actually get to this threshold of significant impact under IMO, under the Polar Code. Um, and here, uh, sorry, up, better get to the right text. Um, so fisheries, the, the shipping sector can actually um, start uh, looking at cumulative impacts on many ships going along a same shipping route um, in, through the Polar Code where ships are, ship owners and flag states are meant to collaborate to share data and to, f to, uh, to plan these routes. Um, and the Polar Code aims to address both safety of ships and the protection of the marine environment in these sensitive regions. Uh, and so, so voyage planning is essential. And the chapter 11 of the Polar Code mandates voyage planning with significant environmental protection commitments. Um, and the idea we have is that these provisions in the Polar Code could be adapted to provide tools and also methodology to formulate uh, an EIA process that can be tailored to any shipping route to ensure that activities avoid or reduce impacts or mitigate impacts that are consistent with the BB&J obligations along the whole port-to-port uh, -port voyage route. Um, and because many of the species um, that, uh, that uh, are in the, in the Arctic and, in, and also around the Antarctic um, uh, occur uh, both in BB&J or in ABNJ and in national waters, this port-to-port -port voyage planning makes even more sense when it comes to migratory species conservation. Um, so we do think that there's an opportunity to, to use the polar code to, uh, to have provisions around considering mammal populations, migratory routes or, that you might encounter to a voyage. Um, ship operators could consider existing best practice to minimize impact and disturbance. Uh, they could look at cultural heritage areas as well, so then we get the cultural aspects in to, to this agreement. 
and so that, so that the traffic that is near these areas do not have significant or damaging impacts. Um, and there's a whole frame for this uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Arctic Shipping uh, Practice Information Forum uh, that, uh, that has been set up under the Arctic Council. If you have more uh, questions about this, I'd be happy to put you in touch with my colleague who is who's working on this, because I do think that this is something that we can work on to sort of promote BB&J ready practices before the BB&J treaty inter enters into force, uh, which probably will take a few years. Uh, it's open for signature for two years, um, and as there's so much um, legislative work to be done in in, uh, in countries, it will take a while probably before it enters into force. So during that time, um, it, things like this, I think, is something we can we can start working on uh, to make sure that the practice is there even before, before the treaty enters into force. Um, so, so with that, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm here for a little bit longer if you want to ask questions as well uh, at the lunch break. Thank you.